that you've been ripped off. Um, Shap in the Hebrew tongue is is uh, napal, and it comes from a prime in Hebrew to hang down or fall away. I, I like that because falling away is what the apostasy is, and we don't want that to happen to any of God's elect. I can tell you something else. It's not going to happen to any of God's election. Why? You've got things to do. Just to say, serving our Father. So it's impossible as long as you stay in the Word to be deceived by man. We're going to talk about that a little bit. It would seem as in our weekly lectures on television that there are thoughts that strike and the Spirit gives and then people that I come in contact with that are so spiritual give me further thought and support and out comes a new message from the Father, hopefully, in his word. Not hopefully, it is. So, I hope you enjoy it. Chaff or wheat, open your Bibles, if you would, to Amos chapter 8. Amos chapter 8. There is a deeper truth here that I want you to see today than we would normally cover in doing this great chapter which tells you what the famine is for in the end times, and we must focus upon that. So we ask a word of wisdom from our Father as we get into his word. Amos chapter 8 and verse 1, it reads, Thus hath the Lord God showed unto me, and behold, a basket of summer fruit. This word summer in the Hebrew means it's ripe. It's ready for harvest. And God looks at this world in this generation and knows it's harvest time. That means the end is near. We're not doomsdayers, but you better be watchmen. Verse 2, And he said, Amos, what seest thou? And I said, A basket of summer fruit, ripe fruit. Then said the Lord unto me, The end is come upon my people of Israel. I will not again pass by them anymore. In other words, they're kind of ripe for chastisement, if you want to know the truth. Not for reward, necessarily. I'm talking about people overall. He's going to tell you why here in a moment. Because most of them were deceived. Most of them misled. Verse 3. And the songs of the temple shall be howlings in that day, saith the Lord God. There shall be many dead bodies in every place. They shall cast them forth with silence, with a hush. Why? They're only spiritually dead. The metabolism is still running currently through the system, the, va the vascular system. They're very much alive, um, biologically speaking, but spiritually they're in sad shape. They're dead. And they walk out, they, they go to a house of God and walk out, and they're still dead, spiritually dead, as far as what is going on around them. That's a sad state of affairs, it really is. Verse 4, hear this, O ye that swallow up the needy, even to make the poor of the land to fail. Who's he talking to? Those that would take advantage of them, those that would mislead them, false teachers, false prophets and even Satan's on the Kenites, standing on every corner waiting to take their just due to mislead, sometimes well-intended. But unfortunately, good intentions without truth are a flop. Let me say that again. Good intentions without truth are bound to fail. You can't help someone if you can't give them something that will stick to their ribs and carry them through hard times where they can say, yes, Father, I know you're with me, stay with me, and you know he will. That's what you need to sustain yourselves, regardless of what happens, God likes can-do type people. And the truth makes you automatically, his promise, a can-do type person. So... Um, those that swallow up are in bad mind. That's the, they are the ones that God's anger is aimed at, not you. You're innocent. You're inoculated, immune to 
to God's wrath. Why? Because he's not mad at you. He's not angry at you. He loves you, and he loves what you're doing. He knows what you go through trying to do what's right. And those that try to swallow you up or take advantage of it, woe be to them. Verse 5, saying, now this is what your enemy is saying, saying, when will the new moon be gone? When, when will next month come so I can get their check? That's kind of my word. I added that. But that's what it means, you know. That we may sell corn and the Sabbath that we may set forth wheat, making the ethos small. Let's, let's make the bushel basket a lot smaller than what it is making the ethos small and the shekel great. Let's throw a lot of inflation in there and run the price up at the grocery store, right? And falsifying, doing what? Falsifying the balances by deceit. Now, that's a real sad state of affairs. And when you, you pretty well can experience that in this generation, and with, if you've allowed yourself to be swallowed up in usury, you especially get a double dose of it. You know what he's talking about. Verse 6, that we may buy the poor for silver and needy for a pair of shoes, yea, and sell the refuse of the wheat. This word refuse is one I stated earlier. It's map pub. It means shaft. And not only that, it's molded. It's mildewed. In other words, we're, we're going to pretend to sell them wheat, but all it's going to be is a bunch of hot air shaft. And do you understand? Now stop and think a moment. What, what, how does the Antichrist come in prosperously and peacefully? Can you be bought with silver? Will gold buy you away from God? I hope not. I really hope not. Because you would be sucker bait for sure if that were your situation. Especially when your father promises you all you need anyway. You're not hard up for gold or silver if you're truly with the father. When you have a need, he'll fill it. See that you can't be bought. There's no price on your soul that belongs to God. Documentation is in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4. All souls belong to God already, regardless of what your stand on it is. Verse 7. The Lord has sworn by the excellency of Jacob, that's the natural people, surely I will never forget any of their works. Uh, uh, what did it say? Works. Do you know what? Many people will abuse you and you think they're getting away with that. No way, friend. They're not getting away with it. It's in the book. God has written it down. When someone abuses one of God's elect, I'm sorry, they're going to pay, and they're going to pay dearly. It's the works. You know what you can take with you from this earth? It's only one thing other than your good soul. Revelation chapter 14, verse 13 stipulates it's your works. Only quite the contrary, your works bring you reward. Why? Because they're good, and God takes note. He doesn't forget works, especially evil works, and I guarantee you he'll see that they pay. He's jealous. Vengeance belongeth to him. That's why he said, maybe if you get a little moment, you better pray for him, because I'm going to whack a ruin. Right. And um, he does. Leave there be no doubt about it. Okay, verse 8. Shall not the land tremble for this? Well, it's not trembling much now, but it shall. I mean, the people's uh, senses. And every one mourn that dwelleth therein, and it shall rise up holy as a flood, and it shall be cast out and drowned as by the flood of Egypt. You know, Satan has a flood that's spoken of in Revelation chapter 12 that he sends af after those that stand with God. How are you doing? God has immune you to that. Why? Because you love him. You love his word. If you forewarn somebody, they're already forearmed. You can't 
tempt somebody that knows it's an abomination coming out the gate. That's not tempting. You can't be tempted by rotten ice cream, if there is such a thing. I don't know, but I suppose there could be. Uh, whatever. It's not tempting. If it belongs to Satan, I don't care if it's sweet, it's not tempting to you. Because everything about him stinks. Everything about him is death because he's death warned over. Documentation, I'll give it to you. Uh, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14. I came to this earth, Christ said, to be crucified and just, just to destroy the devil, which is to say death. He is death. Why? He's the only one sentenced to die. So works are important. And, and beloved, listen, it might be just smiling at a, a Christian that's down a little bit. It might be just say, I'm with you, appreciate you. That, that is good works because, uh, you know, it doesn't take much when, in a true Christian, when they're kind of down, to give them a big boost. And after all, it's, it is free because Christ has already paid the price for kindness and compassion one to another. I didn't say it to Satan, but one to another. He's got a flood coming, but you don't have to worry. It won't bother you. Verse 9, And it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord, that I will cause the sun to go down at noon, and I will darken the earth in the clear day. That's a day of darkness. To who? Not to you. Why? You're a child of light. You produce light. In other words, this is given in a spiritual sense. And I'm going to, I'm going to shake all this back to you for the spiritual here in a moment. We're just going through here a little bit, and then we're going to see the real in-depth spiritual connotation. I say, hold your place there. Turn backwards in the Bible, Amos, to the very next book. Go to Joel, the very book right before uh, Amos. Go to chapter 2. Let's read a couple of verses here, speaking of that darkness. Incidentally, let me lay groundwork. You all know what this book of Joel is about. It's what they were saying on Pentecost Day, not in an unknown tongue. But Peter said, this is that that was spoken of by Joel the prophet. That's why they were amazed. Listen to it. Verse 1. Blow ye the trumpet in Zion, of chapter 2, Joel. And sound an alarm in my holy mountain, and let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord cometh, for it is nigh at hand, a day of darkness and of gloominess, a day of clouds, of thick darkness as the morning spread upon the mountains, a great people and a strong, our enemies, all right? They are great. They are strong. There hath not been ever the like, neither shall be any more after it, even to the years of many generations. In other words, all down through history, you will not have seen so many people deceived into accepting the false Messiah. That's why it's dark. They fall away. The same meaning of chaff in the Hebrew. To, it means to hang down or to fall away, just like chaff does. You can picture it if you've observed it, you know. And that's what people are going to do if they're not careful. It's called the great apostasy. Okay, returning then to the 8th chapter of Amos. Now, incidentally, I might add while you're turning back, that particular chapter of Joel is the one that stipulates as it is written on Pentecost Day in Acts chapter 2, as well as what they said, that the sons and both the daughters shall prophesy, shall see dreams that God will use both men and women at that time to bring the truth, the real truth, before the world, even even in that dark day, what a light, bright and shining you will be among Babylon, confusion, to have that stability and you're it, friend. Why? God loves you. But what's most important, you love his word. Okay, back to Amos chapter 8, verse 10. And I will turn your feast into mourning. And uh, all your songs into lamentation, and I will bring up sackcloth upon all loins. 
and baldness upon every head. These are signs of sorrow, okay? And I will make it as the morning of an only son, and the end thereof as a bitter day. Tell you what, when that day comes, and they have followed the spurious Messiah, and they see the true Christ coming, it's going to be a sad day. There won't be any church socials that day. And not that I'm against churches having socials if they so choose, but hey, they need to get around to teaching God's Word to the people, feeding the sheep. That's important, whereby they hear from God rather than traditions. Verse 11, Behold, the days come, not maybe, the days will come, saith the Lord, that I will send a famine in the land. Now, I'm at the key that I brought you here for. Listen carefully. That I will send a famine in the land, not a famine for bread. That's not a famine for the tummy. Nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. That's what the famine will be. How many of you, and I'm, I'm not, certainly not knocking churches, you know I've never, you've never heard me mention a church by name and criticize it. I won't do that. But I will criticize all churches that do not teach the Word of God chapter by chapter and verse by verse, whereby the children have an opportunity to hear what saith the Lord. He has so many promises and so many blessings. And unless you hear those promises and take care of the ifs, in other words, this is a promise if you do this or that, and the if is most often hear the voice of God, how could you be blessed? How could you hear the promises that they weren't taught, or unless you covered them yourself? It's up to you. Okay. But don't let the shaft get mixed into your wheat. All right? Stay with the true thing, and that's always the Word of God. So what is this famine? Not for food. The famine of the end times, if you're looking for it, is for hearing the real voice of God, for hearing the truth of God, whereby you are inoculated, which simply means that, that you're not subject to any of the things that might come in the last day because you're his child, other than witnessing for him, and him with you every step of the way. He will never leave thee, nor will he forsake thee. And don't you ever doubt it. If you do, your faith is kind of bottomed out, and, and you need to, to get aired up again. All right? Uh, that's a good analogy, I guess. But anyway, you need to get rejuvenated all right, in the Word, because you can't have help but have faith. And you're familiar with the voice of God when you're not on that famine, hunger, starving, trip. Okay. Verse 12. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east. They shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord, and shall not find it. I, re I don't know how many letters I received. I can't find a church. This is from all over the world. I can't find a church that teaches the word. Once they taste it, it's difficult to, to let go. And except seconds or some place that always serve as sloppy jokes. Now, I don't know how that came out, but whatever, okay? It's samey, samey, all right? But I receive those letters by the hundreds. And it's sad. It's just something you could almost weep over. Verse 13. In that day shall the fair virgins and young men faint for thirst. Again, what's the famine for? Truth. How, how can young people have an opportunity to please and be blessed of God if, if they don't know the Word, if they don't know what pleases Him? They can't. 14. That they swear by the sin of Samaria and say, Thy God, notice the lower case on the word God, O Dan, liveth and the manner of Bathsheba, Bathsheba means the well of the oath. But do you know what they did there? They worshipped two calves in, out of Samaria, live it. Even they shall fall and never rise again. So, in other words, they turned to worshipping some god other than our father, which is to say, you know, he's talking about the false messiah. For that's the generation into which he comes. Now, we've got to do a little algebra. 
if food equals ignorance of God's word, that is to say that famine equals the starvation for God's word, then what does wheat, what is what X concerning wheat stand for? It certainly, if it's not bread, it's not, we're not talking about wheat. God's not talking about grain. All right? He's talking about false teachings. If you get false teachings, you don't hear the truth of God's word. So they can't. So let's go back and rethink that just a little bit. Hear this, verse uh, five, saying, saying of chapter eight of uh, Amos, saying, "When will the new moon be gone that we may sell corn?" It's not corn they're selling; it's lies, misteachings, and the Sabbath that we may set forth wheat and make it the ephah small and the shackle great and falsifying the balances by deceit. That's teachings of God's word they're falsifying. And some of the examples, and I know I use this quite a bit, but please bear with me. It gets it said, and that's what I'm in the business of is communicating. You, because all of you have heard it. Man shortens the balances by saying, hey, you don't have to understand the Word of God. All you have to do is just believe. You don't have to understand the book of Revelation. Just believe me. Now, if you will listen to some man instead of God, you know, don't you admit you got trouble. I mean, you're in a heap of, of uh, hurt. If you will tell some man God didn't have enough sense to write the Bible where you could understand it, if he was doing his work and is a good teacher, that is to, wisdom is to take that that is complicated and simplify it from the original, whereby we can all understand it because Christ taught in simplicity. So they can't wait to put, dream up some new thing, some new type of religion that will turn the people on and bring them into the door. What can we do? I knew a church one time that put five dollars, glued it under, or taped it under a seat and advertised it, and people would come to, and you'd see them, instead of listening, they're all reaching, you know. Is this the chair that's got the five bucks? Five bucks then was pretty good. Some, but that's no reason, that's no way to bring people to church. It's so simple, feed them and they'll be there. You don't have to advertise. Just feed God's Word, and the people will be here. But they can't wait to come up with new ways. Do you know that some of them write, especially in the, my uh, peers that are on television, they do have real large bills, I'll admit. I know that for a fact, but that's all right. If you're doing God's work, He'll take care of it. You don't have to advertise. But they will start planning in July to write their sad Christmas letter. And this is a fact. They do. They start writing it way back in July. And do you know what they say? This is the poorest month we've had all year. Now, I'm, I'm going to tell you the truth. It's always the best. December is the best month churches have. If there are any church at all, that means teaching God's Word. Or just a regular church, because people are in a giving mood. But that's not what the letters say. So they're thinking up gimmicks, naturally. We're going to go to Micah 3, and I want to pick it up with about verse 5, all right? Concerning the dark day. Micah 5 reads, Thus saith the Lord concerning the prophets that make my people err that bite with their teeth and cry peace. And he that putteth not into their mouths, and what's the analogy? Into their minds the truth so they can stand, that they even prepare war against him. Now, um, false prophets have one plan, that's to rip you off, all right? They, they're either on an ego trip, uh, for some reason, false teachings, power, 
and many times money. Therefore, night shall be unto you, and ye shall not have a vision, and it shall be dark unto you that ye shall not do bind, and the sun shall go down over the prophets, and the day shall be dark over them. Not over you, beloved, over them. You've got to learn to separate yourself from the losers. It's real easy for you to get the... If you associate your mind with their losing ways to be a loser yourself, you're not. You're a winner. Live it. Believe it. Why? God loves you. He's talking not to you, but it's the enemies this happens to. You're not an enemy of God. One more verse, 7. Then shall the seers be ashamed. A seer is a prophet, okay? And diviners confounded, yea, they shall all cover their lips. Close my mouth. What did I say? Okay, that's what they'll be saying. Yea, shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer of God. God doesn't answer anyone that's not familiar in his word to know how to get answers from him. Naturally, well, where do I get an answer from his word? It's all written. I have foretold my prophets all things. Well, are you familiar with the prophets? They're all written. Then you would be able to find through study and research the answer to most any problem you have, or at least you know someone that can tell you where to go and look to find the answer to your problems. The real secret is not... Let someone else take care of your problems. I mean, what are you? You're a child of God. You can reason them out for yourself. Now, we still have each other for comfort. Don't misunderstand comfort with working your own problems out. Fix it. If it's broke, fix it. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Many people will say, they'll say, my marriage is a mess. I think my husband's slipping around. Well, did you see? No. It's just the way men do. I just feel it down in my bone. Hey, you know, you keep, you keep adding that way, or your wife, vice versa. I guarantee you, you might drive them to it. So, you, you have to fix things for yourself. Have yours better than anybody else's. As for, I mean, work at it that hard. But solve it with God with you. Now, this is, this is why I say that. If God is with you, I guarantee you, you can do it. Because you're a can-do type person. Keep plowing. You'll find a way out. All right? And uh, naturally, again, that's what we have friends for, is for comfort. Okay, uh, let's, go to, let's go to another prophet here, uh, back this time to Isaiah, one of the greatest and let's keep talking about this. This is a time element. What's it going to be like just before the end? What's going to happen to you? You want to be prepared. You want to know. Well, that's what we're going to find out. Isaiah chapter 13. Isaiah chapter 13, verse 6. Now, this is the bur burden of Babylon. Babylon means confusion, and it's the old Babylon also a type of that one in Revelation that's on you. So let it fall on your ears well. Verse 6 of, Revela of uh, Isaiah 13. How ye, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It's real close. It shall come as a destruction from the Almighty. Now, many people right there, their hearts just start trembling. Is he coming to destroy you? What's the answer? No, of course not. He's coming to destroy the evilness of this world. Praise God. Just as the Hebrew children walked in the fiery furnace and Christ walked with them, they weren't singed. To document to you that God can have you right in the heart of it doing his work and they can't touch you. Okay? Seven. Therefore shall all hands be faint, and every man's heart shall melt, and they shall be afraid. Pains and sorrows shall take hold of them. They shall be in pain as a woman that travaileth. They shall be amazed one at another. Their faces shall be as flames. That means they're going to glean with probably perspiration and fear. Now, 
Well, what does this always signify? What happens in labor pains? Do they get further and further apart? No. They get closer and closer together until there is a birth. And we're talking here about the birth of a new age, the birth of a new dispensation. You've got a great role in it. But what's more important, or as important, you have a great place in being where you're supposed to be as the confirmation of these events bring us to that day. He wants you and he needs you if if you have studied his word and you know the, the orders of the day. That is to say, how God's going to bring it to pass. And also that you have ears. May your ears be open. May your eyes be open. If there's anything ever I pray for an individual, it's that their eyes be open and their ears be open. That then they can see for themselves and take care of themselves and, and be blessed. Verse 9, Behold, the day of the Lord cometh cruel. I would rather translate this stern. Okay? But it's going to be cruel. Some are going to think. But it's justice. And I don't want to call justice cruel both with wrath and furious anger to lay the land desolate and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. And he's not talking about some person that sins occasionally. He's talking about habitual sinners. They're gone. They're out of here. Won't that be nice? Now, during the millennium, naturally, there's going to be a lot of teaching going on because a lot of people haven't got a prayer of a chance today. Why? Because there's no truth being taught in, in many places. And hey, I'm not calling them or recommending them. You judge for yourself. And you know that that word is true. Verse 10, For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. Do you know why? Christ's light, when he appears, is so bright, so loving, so wonderful. I'm talking about his countenance, his personality, his very being, his presence. And do you know something? You're a reflection of that. That's why you don't have to worry about the darkness. You are a light. Your very soul brings a light. The gleam of your eye mirrors the soul. And there's no darkness there. Why? Because you have the Word. No one can stop you. They may slow you down a little bit, but honey, you better get out of the way because that friend of mine is going right on through. It's going to happen. God is in control. Verse 11, And I will punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. And I will cause the arrogance of the proud to cease and will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. That's why nobody wants to touch you, friend. Somebody picks on you, they're picking, it's like touching God's eye. Do you know that scriptural? If somebody picks on you, it's like they poke their finger in God's eye. Now, that's not nice. It hurts him that way. Needless to say, he's going to do something about it. You can count on it. If you're studying with me in Deuteronomy, I'll document that for you in two or three days next week, all right? And I forget, we're televising right now, and these dear friends will hear this. Only God knows when or where, but I'm talking about the lie portion, all right? Verse 12, I will make a man more precious. There's no gender in this. It means man or woman. I will make a man or a woman more precious than fine gold, even a man than the golden wedge of Ophir. Ophir was the greatest, the finest, richest gold, the purest gold there was. That's what God thinks of you. Don't sell yourself out. Antichrist is coming in prosperously. He's coming in peaceably. Don't sell out. You're more valuable than that. You're precious to the living God. Don't put, don't fall in where things moths can eat and silver can tarnish. You've got something prettier than that. It's your light. And don't forget it. Okay. Now, we're going to, while we're here in Isaiah, let's, uh, real quickly, let's turn over to chapter 59. And then we're going to go to the New Testament. 
and see if the New Testament backs any of this up. Isaiah chapter 59, we're going to pick it up with verse 9, and this has to do with God's ability to save or to protect you in a sense, if you were to begin with verse 1. Pick it up with 9, though, for the sake of time. Isaiah 59, 9. Therefore is judgment far from us, neither doth justice overtake us. We wait for light, but behold obscurity. This is on that day of darkness. For brightness, but we walk in darkness. You don't have to, beloved. It's entirely up to you, but you don't have to walk in that darkness of the unknown. We grope for the wall like the blind, and we and spiritually blind they are. And we grope as if we had no eyes. We stumble at noonday as in the night. We are in desolate places as dead men, spiritually dead. And even if it is noon in the brightest part of the day, they're still in darkness spiritually. Beloved, how many people do you know like that? Many of them think they're in pretty good shape. But if you start having a Bible discussion with them, they say, well, I'll have to ask my preacher. I don't, I don't read the Bible, or I don't know the Word, or, you know, I just, uh, I really don't know. I don't have an opinion on that. And it might be something really important. Sad. What? Verse 11. We roar all like bears. We grumble and growl and complain about everything, and mourn sore like doves. We look for judgment, but there is none for salvation but it is far off from us. Why? God hides from you after a while. Unless you really get serious. He just he's going he's not going to be ready to accept you until you're ready to accept him, period. Do you blame him? Verse twelve For our transgressions are multiplied before thee, and our sins testify against us. For our transgressions are with us. And as for our iniquities, that's to say our sins, we know them. And it's kind of sad if you know what your sins are, that is to say, in lack of asking forgiveness. I don't care if you have a bad habit. Don't pretty soon repent of that. Ask for strength to overcome it. I don't care if it takes ten years. Keep praying for strength to overcome it. Thirteen, in transgression and lying against the Lord... In departing away from our God, speaking oppression and revolt, conceiving and uttering from the heart words of falsehood. That won't cut it, friend. That will never bring you peace of mind, is listening to false teachings. Where do you get true teachings? From the Word, chapter by chapter and verse by verse. Let me ask you something. Have you ever picked up a novel and read the first paragraph out of the last chapter and then read the second paragraph out of the first chapter and expect to make any sense out of it? No, it's not going to. Neither is the Word of God. And judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off, for truth is fallen in the street, and equity cannot enter. It can't. Fairness can't be present if truth isn't. Why? They don't know. They don't know what truth is. They don't know what's coming. So how can they help people if they're not familiar with the plan of God? That's what he's saying. Yea, truth faileth. I mean, truth is missing there. And he that departeth from evil maketh himself a prey, and the Lord saw it, and it displeased him that there was no judgment. God wants judgment. You know, judgment means fairness. If you're taken to court, God expects fairness there that you're treated right. Otherwise, somebody's going to pay. God will see to it. I don't care what the judge decides or anyone else. God will see that his election have justice. That's what judgment, correct judgment is, is administering justice. One more verse, and we leave here. And he saw that there was no man, and wondered that there was no intercessor. Therefore his arm, his saving arm, I like to think of, brought salvation unto him, and his righteousness it sustained him. He sent the Lord. He sent Jesus Christ as your intercessor. He knew you needed him. Why? We're weak. And he will hold you up. 
He loves you, and He will take you to Him, embrace you, and give you the way, the path, for He is the way, the path. Speaking of Christ, this intercessor, this Son, what did He say to you concerning that day? He was asked, Lord, what's it going to be like just at the end? And tell us these things. How are they going to come to pass that consummate the end of this age? And he gave some very good advice that you never want to forget. He did that in Mark chapter 13 in the New Testament. The chapter that you're all familiar with. It tells you what will happen to you and what you're supposed to do at the appearance of that one. And after being asked in Mark 13, verse 4, tell us, when shall these things be, and what shall be the signs when all these things shall be fulfilled? When it gets here, when it's actually happening, listen carefully to Jesus' warning. And Jesus answered them and began to say, take heed, lest any man deceive you. Now, did he say, lest Satan deceive you? Uh Uh-uh. Man, verse 6, for many shall come in my name. What name? Christ's name. Christian. Saying, I am Christ and shall deceive many. Now, I want to ask you something. It doesn't really take a rocket scientist. Does he say, I want you to watch out for witchcraft? I, I, I want you to watch out for these, um, what do they call men, witches, whatever. Okay, I've never I've really met one, but, and the name just escapes me. You know what I'm talking about. Warlock, yeah. Did he say, be worried about some warlock? They're usually some sick person that's never had any attention, and they got to say, I'll be a warlock. How do I look, huh? Now, trying to get attention, see, poor, mixed up. Did he say, watch them, be careful of them? No. He didn't say that. He said, you be careful of those that claim to be teachers of my word. That's what it means. They come in my name. They're the ones you want to watch. Why? They twist Scripture. And, beloved, if you're not familiar with Scripture, you don't know whether they twisted it or not. Satan gave you a prime example of that in Matthew 4 when he tempted Christ. What did he tempt Christ with? Scripture. And if you don't know Scripture pretty good, you don't know that Satan misquoted it about a half a turn right at the end. Changed it. That didn't bother Christ because he knew what the Word said. The twisting didn't harm it. So when people twist the Word on you, that's what he said be careful of. You don't be careful of those that come in my name because you can be you can be deceived a lot easier from someone that you think is just like you are than somebody that say I'll be a warlock. You know, you're, you're, if he says I'm a warlock, you're going to be on guard a hundred percent anyway. You know, you're not going with it. But religion can draw you into a lot of things. Christ has something for you to do. You've all covered it, and we've got uh, just a minute here. We're going to go just a little bit further now that we've nailed this down. What did he say to be careful of? Those that come in my name, claiming to be from me, or even the false Christ. Anti simply means instead. Okay, verse uh, 7. And when you shall hear wars and rumors of wars, be not troubled, for such things must these be, but the end shall not be yet. What's the opposite of wars and rumors of wars? When they cry, peace, but don't feed you. Okay. You're not going to find peace of mind without, without having the solidity of sanity and truth in your mind that nobody can shake you. For nation shall rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom, and there shall be earthquakes in diverse places, and there shall be famines. I hope now you know what that famine is. It's not for bread. And don't you ever let somebody suck you into that. Not for bread. And troubles. These are the beginnings of sorrows. This word sorrows in the Greek means labor pains. It's the beginning of the labor pains that bring in the birth of a new age. Nine. But take heed to yourself. You be careful, for they shall deliver you up to councils. That's Sanhedrin. 
And in the synagogues of Satan, of course, you shall be beaten. That's only browbeaten, though. They're going to browbeat you if you get a chance, saying, hey, you're wrong, you know, here's the man. And you shall be brought before rulers and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them. Have you ever thought what an awesome age you live in, that God might use you for something that important? He sure might. As a matter of fact, I guarantee you he will, if you've got the starch called faith that holds you in line with him. A lot of Christians say, I just wish I knew what I was supposed to do. Read that verse right there. It's an awesome responsibility. Why? Verse 10. And the gospel must first be published among all nations. God intends to see that it happens. Is that because you're a superior Bible scholar? That you've studied the Bible all your life and you know it from page 1 to 2? No. Listen. 11. But when they shall lead you and deliver you up, take no thought beforehand. That's, don't you premeditate. Don't you think about what you know. What you shall speak, neither do you premeditate, but whatsoever shall be given you in that hour. That's the hour of temptation when Satan is here. That speak you, for it is not ye that speak, but the Holy Spirit. He's going to speak through you. That the real truth. Luke 21 stipulates, as you well know, that even the gainsayers will be convinced by what you say at that time. And do you know something? That's what was spoken on Pentecost Day when both the sons and the daughters begin to speak concerning the things that would happen during that dark day, that dark hour. You are precious enough that you happen to be living in that generation, the generation of the fig tree. Christ in the book of Luke gave some precious information in the 12th chapter. You may begin turning there if you like. We're going to close there. He told in chapter 12, verse 10, what the unforgivable sin was. And do you know what it is? The unforgivable sin is for one that knows the truth, knows that this rascal is the false Christ, and disallows the Holy Spirit to speak through them. But he had something that he followed that up with that is a message for you that have eyes to see and ears to hear. And and concludes what we've been talking about today. I want to go with verse 22. This has to do with worry. I don't know, are you a worry wart? Hmm? Does life worry you? You get all kind of shook up and nervous. Well, listen to this. It's the cap for everything we've studied about who God's angry at and how he helps you. So, if you're a worrier, pay very strict attention. Verse 22 of Luke chapter 12. And he said unto his disciples, Therefore I say unto you, Take no thought. Translate that worry. Take no worry for your life. What you shall eat, neither for the body, what you shall put on. Do you know why? Let me eat. Well, I have to worry about it. No, you don't. God will take care of it. That's what he's telling you. You don't have to worry about it. I'll take, I'll handle it. 23, the life is more than meat, and the body is more than raiment. In other words, your soul to him is so very precious. He's not all that worried about what you're going to wear, but he's going to give you something nice to wear if you meet the conditions. 24, consider the ravens. Look, look at the birds. For they neither sow nor reap, which neither have storehouse nor barn. They don't work at it. And God feedeth them. Do you think he can't handle you? How much more are you better than the fowls? God considers you a lot better. And he's going to feed you. And actually, think also, hey, sometimes, sometimes we get a little down and we have to worry about food a little bit, but the main food is the Word of God. Don't forget that. 25. And which of you with taking thought, which of you that's a worrier, can add to his life, to his stature, one cubic. That means, do you think worrying will make you live one moment longer? No, no, really quite the contrary. If you're a worrier, you're probably going to live shorter. You don't do any, it doesn't do any good. Allow me, Southern. It don't do no good <laughs> to worry, all right? 
it, it just complicates your clear thinking process, all right? It doesn't do, it just won't help you out one hour. 26. If ye then be not able to do that thing which is least, why take ye thought or worry for the rest? You know? What's the least? That you love him, believe him, trust him, he's your father, and you talk about can do, he can cut it. Verse 27. Consider the lilies. Let's look at the flowers a little bit. How they grow, they toil not, they don't work, they spin not, and yet I say unto you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Do you think I can't make your life beautiful is what God is saying? If you love me, do you think I can't make your life wonderful? 28. If then God so clothed the grass which is today in the field and tomorrow is cast into the oven, Right? That's, this is bread. The famine's not for that. So remember, how much more will he clothe you, O you of little faith, you that doubt, you that worry? If you meet his conditions, there are conditions, though, beloved. That's that you love him, that you let him know you love him, that he can trust you, that he can use you, and you're not going to let him down in the pinch. When? Well, maybe back in Mark 13 when he says, I'm counting on you. When you're delivered up, you don't have to worry about your knowledge. Just let the Holy Spirit speak to you as the sons and daughters did on Pentecost Day. Hey, I relish that thought. I say, let's get it on. Let's get it over with, you know. So don't be afraid of that time, but rather consider it precious, all right? 29. And seek not ye what ye shall eat. Don't worry about what you're going to eat or what ye shall drink. Neither be ye doubtful, uh, be ye of doubtful mind. Don't don't be a worry wart. That's really what he's saying. It just it's wasted time. All right. Thirty. For listen carefully. For all these things do the nations of the world seek after. That's to say, unbelievers. Uh, that's to say. Um, the nations, okay, and your father knoweth, he does what? Your father knoweth that you have need of these things. Well, I didn't know God knew I needed a new pair of britches. Well, what makes you, you think God is limited? Of course he does. He knows what you need. Verse 31, but rather seek, this is what you do to, to fix it, but rather seek ye the kingdom of God and all, how many? All these things, new bridges and all, all these things shall be added unto you. He'll show you how to make it. He'll take care of you. He'll seal up the holes in your bucket that everything's been leaking out of, that you can't get anywhere. He can fix it. I know that to be true, beloved. You're looking at an example of it as a ministry that doesn't have any holes in its bucket that God takes care of, and there's no worry. I don't have to worry about it. I know. I believe. And, and, and I'm certain that doesn't make me perfect. I've got sin just like everyone else. Uh, four or five years ago, I said something. I don't know what it was. But anyway. <laughs> oh, but to God that were true. Forgive me, Father. 32. To fear not, little flock. He's talking to you here. Fear not, for it is your Father's good pleasure. It pleases Him, tickles Him. Good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So it's not hard to seek after. Pray for it. Say, Father, give me understanding. Now listen carefully. Here's why we came here. 33. Sell that you have and give alms. Provide yourself bags with wax, which wax not old treasures in heaven that faileth not, which no thief approacheth, neither moth corrupteth. Now, what are your real riches? That knowledge that you have tucked away right here that could change a life. You spend it. By spend it, I mean you invest the knowledge you have. We're not talking about money here. We're talking about the most precious thing you have, and that's the knowledge in your forehead about how God blesses people. So you sell it to them. 
Well, what do you mean sell it to them? Let them have it, both barrels, you know. Be gentle, you're a fisherman, okay? Invest that truth when you see someone in trouble. Don't hang on to it. Don't hide your light under a bushel. It never can grow that way. It can never grow that way. So invest it and don't put uh, your treasures where a thief can take it. Now, that would be your monies and so forth. 34, we're going to quit here real soon. Hang on. 34. For where your treasure is, there your heart, your mind be also. I don't know, what do you consider most precious? I hope your father. For it pleases him to bless you. And unless you love him, he's not going to bless you. Okay? Let your loins be girded about and your lights burning. So, um, I want to make sure that we understand. No thief approacheth, nor moth corrupteth. You know what will happen? Don't let somebody sell you that old cheap shaft. You know, I didn't realize how careful I had to be in saying that. But it's terrible when you think about how our father can make or break someone. That old shaft is there for you. They're going to try to pawn it off on you. Well, it, how many of you know that we're talking about the hull that goes around the wheat, and you you look at a hull laying there, and it looks like a grain of wheat. Okay? Do you know what I mean? Unless you touch it or unless you're very familiar with it, it looks like you're getting the real thing. But you're not. If you only get the hull. And I think you could look up the shaft in the Webster's and I think it would say a worthless byproduct of, of grain. Right, well, be that as it may. It's also concerning God's Word. Byproducts of man are worthless compared to the real truth. So, be careful. The famine of the end times is for knowledge from God's Word. If you have it, you share it. Please, again, don't... Con I didn't tell you to go print up a bunch of tracts and go down to the stoplight and split up and start passing out tracts. That won't cut it. God knows when you're to plant a seed, and he'll let you know. If that seed doesn't grow, leave it alone. Protect your credibility. God knows what you need when you serve him, and he will fulfill your needs. Father, we thank you for the word, Father. We thank you for your guidance, your direction. Please be with these by, to all they come in contact with. Use them, Father. To thy honor and thy glory, we be thy servants. In Jesus' precious name, amen. We invite you to join us for the next in-depth Bible study each weekday at this same time. Thank you for watching today's program, and God bless you. Ecclesiastes. This certainly is a book that is a must for every servant of God. And I'll tell you why. It is an acrostic in a sense in this respect, that it is written to the man that walks under the sun, which means a man that walks in a flesh body, telling you how to find peace of mind and how to control, if you would, your walk in this flesh body, telling you how to find happiness, also telling you what you're here for and telling you what peace of mind is, teaching you those things that are not necessary, that one can discipline oneself to certainly walk peacefully and happy and boldly in our Heavenly Father. The book of Ecclesiastes meaning the preacher, the wisest of all, Solomon to you.
Welcome to the Shepherd's Chapel Network Family Bible Study Hour with Pastor Arnold Murray. Wisdom is understanding God's Word. Pastor Murray's unique teaching approach...